My insane boyfriend invited my estranged parents to my house without telling me, so I broke up with him. He started stalking me and harassing me to win me back, so I filed a restraining order and had him arrested. When I met my boyfriend John, I opened up to him about my family life, about the kind of monsters my parents were, and about how my 18th birthday present was my mother making me homeless. He was supportive at first and asked how my relationship was with them nowadays, but when I told him I didn't have one, he looked at me in disgust. He soon started pressuring me into reconnecting with my parents, asking me to try for him on a weekly basis. And as a cherry on top, I found out he had been messaging my father in secret. When I confronted him, he acted like he did nothing wrong. He said that my father was a good man who has changed, and it would make me an awful person to not give him a second chance. I absolutely exploded and was on the verge of breaking up with him, but he promised to never bring up my family again. I deeply regret believing him, because not even a month later, I came home to find my mom and dad in my house. I felt myself tense up in fear and turned around to leave, but John blocked the door. He told me I needed to hear my parents out, but before he could finish his sentence, I clawed at him and kicked him in the gonards. He fell to the floor and I ran out. I got in my car and started driving, but as soon as I did, John called me. The first few times, I ignored it. I couldn't face him right then, but after a dozen missed calls, I pulled over, my hands shaking as I answered the phone. His voice came through, sounding remorseful, apologetic even. He said he was sorry, that he didn't mean to hurt me. He was just trying to help. He thought I needed to fix things with my parents. He thought that in the end, I'd be better off for it. I didn't know what to say. I was still angry angrier than I'd ever been before. But there was this small part of me that wanted to believe him. I wanted to believe that he had good intentions, that he didn't mean to hurt me. So I told him I needed space. He agreed, and for the next few days, we didn't speak. Eventually, we met up. John texted me over and over again, asking to meet so we could talk face to face. He said he needed me to understand why he did what he did, that he couldn't bear to let things end like this, not without explaining himself. I wasn't sure if I could handle seeing him after what had happened, but part of me wanted to hear him out. Maybe I was looking for closure. Maybe I was hoping he could say something that would make sense of everything. We met at a small park near my apartment. It was quiet, just a few people walking their dogs or jogging by, and we sat on a bench at the far end where no one could overhear us. John's face looked tired, his hair a little messier than usual, and his eyes, those eyes that I had once found so warm, were now full of guilt. He started by apologizing, his voice soft and careful, as if he was afraid that anything too loud might push me further away. I'm sorry, he said, looking down at the ground. I never wanted to hurt you. I just, I didn't know how else to help. I thought I was doing the right thing. I stayed silent. My arms crossed tightly over my chest. I wasn't going to let him off the hook that easily. He needed to explain, and I wasn't about to jump in with forgiveness before I heard every word. John sighed and ran his hands through his hair. Look, I know I overstepped. I get that now. But you have to understand. I wasn't trying to go behind your back to hurt you. I've seen how much your past has affected you, and it kills me. I wanted to fix it. I wanted to be the one who helped you heal. That's why I reached out to your dad. I thought if I could just show you that people can change, that your parents might be different now, then maybe, maybe you wouldn't have to carry that pain with you anymore. His words hung in the air for a moment, and I could feel the weight of them. He wasn't just apologizing, he was framing it in a way that made him look like the hero. He wanted to be the one who swooped in and fixed my life, whether I wanted him to or not. It wasn't about my feelings or my trauma, it was about him wanting to feel like the good guy. I could feel my heart pounding in my chest as I struggled to stay calm. John, you don't get to decide what's best for me. You don't get to choose whether or not I reconcile with my parents. That's not your call to make. I know, he said quickly, reaching for my hand, but I pulled away. I know, I realize that now, but at the time, I thought I was helping. I love you, and I just wanted you to see that people can change, that they deserve second chances. He leaned in closer, his eyes pleading with me. You don't have to forgive them. You don't even have to talk to them again if you don't want to. But I was thinking about our future, you know. I didn't want you to keep carrying this anger with you forever. I thought maybe, if you had closure with them, we could move forward together, without all the baggage. That word, baggage, made my stomach twist my pain, my trauma, everything I had been through. He was calling it baggage, like it was some heavy suitcase I could just set down if I tried hard enough. It wasn't that simple. It had never been that simple. I'm not baggage, John, I said, my voice low but steady. What happened to me isn't something you can just fix with a conversation, and you definitely don't get to decide how I deal with it. You don't get to go behind my back and invite my parents into my life just because you think it's what's best. He frowned, clearly frustrated that I wasn't seeing things his way. I wasn't trying to fix you, I swear. I just, he paused, searching for the right words. I just thought you were letting the past control your life, and I didn't want that for you. I wanted to help you let go. I shook my head. You don't get it, do you? You don't understand what they did to me, what they took from me. You don't know how hard it's been to build a life without them, and you definitely don't get to decide when I'm ready to let go of anything. There was a long silence between us. John's face fell, and for a moment I thought I saw real regret there. He seemed to be processing everything I had said, and maybe, just maybe, he was starting to understand. Then, just 
Just as quickly, his expression shifted. He leaned back on the bench, his arms crossing over his chest, and I saw something harder, more defensive in his eyes. I'm sorry, he said, but his tone was different now. I thought I was helping. I thought you'd be grateful, but clearly you don't want to fix things. You just want to stay angry. You just want to be the victim forever. His words cut through me like a knife. The apology was gone, replaced by a bitter, almost resentful edge. In his mind, he had done everything right, and I was the one who was wrong for not accepting it. I'm not a victim, I said quietly, though my voice shook with anger. I'm someone who gets to decide who's in my life and who isn't. And if you can't respect that, then maybe you shouldn't be in my life either. John's eyes widened slightly, as if he hadn't expected me to stand up for myself. He opened his mouth to say something else, but I stood up before he could get another word in. I need time to think, I said, my voice cold. And if you really care about me, you'll give me that space. Don't contact me until I reach out to you. I walked away from him, my heart pounding in my chest. I didn't know if I could ever forgive him, but for now, I needed to be alone. For a while, things were calm again. John stayed true to his word, giving me the space I asked for. We didn't speak for nearly two weeks, and during that time, I tried to sort through my emotions. Part of me missed him, the way things had been before all of this happened, but another part of me, the stronger part, knew that something was fundamentally broken between us. Trust had been shattered, and I didn't know if it could ever be repaired. But then, just as I was beginning to feel like I could breathe again, John re-entered my life in the worst way possible. It started with a text message, this time, not from John, but from my father. It was short and to the point. He asked to meet up for coffee, said he wanted to talk things through, and move forward. My heart sank as I stared at the screen, realizing that John had broken his promise. He must have given my father my phone number. I immediately confronted John, dialing his number and demanding an explanation. When he picked up, there was no hesitation in his voice, no denial. He admitted to it without missing a beat. I thought it was time, he said, as if that was all the justification he needed. I gave your dad your number because I thought it was time for you to make peace with him. I know you said you needed space, but I've been thinking about it, and I still believe you'll be happier in the long run if you just talk to them. I couldn't even respond. The sheer audacity of it left me speechless for a moment. My hands shook as I listened to him ramble on, trying to explain why he had done it, why he still believed he was helping me, even after everything I had told him. Finally, I found my voice. You don't get to decide that, I said, my voice cold with anger. You don't get to decide anything about my family or my life. I told you to stay out of it, and you went behind my back again. He tried to interrupt, but I wasn't finished. No, John, you need to listen. You've shown me time and time again that you don't respect my boundaries. This isn't love. This is control. There was a long pause on the other end of the line. For a moment, I thought he might argue, but instead, he sighed. I I just wanted to help, he muttered, the self-pity clear in his voice, but I wasn't having it anymore. I was done with his excuses, his manipulation, and his refusal to take responsibility. We're done, I said, my voice firm. This is over. Don't contact me again. I'm blocking you, and if you try to reach out, I'll go to the police. I hung up before he could respond, my heart racing as I did it. For a moment, I felt a surge of relief. It was over. I'd made the decision I should have made a long time ago. John was out of my life, and I could finally start to heal. But that feeling didn't last long. The harassment Harassment started almost immediately after the breakup. At first, it was subtle. I'd receive blocked calls at odd hours of the night, and when I answered, no one would speak on the other end. Then, there were the emails. John had made a new account. Several new accounts, actually and began sending me long, rambling messages. They ranged from apologies, begging me to take him back, to angry rants about how I was throwing away everything good we had. I blocked every email address he used, but new ones would pop up within days. He was relentless. Sometimes he would switch tactics entirely, sending me flowers with handwritten notes apologizing, promising he had changed, or asking me to meet him just to talk. I threw the flowers away immediately, but every time I saw a bouquet on my doorstep, my stomach would twist with anxiety. The worst part was, he wasn't just contacting me online or leaving gifts. I started to notice him lurking near my apartment. At first, it was just in the distance, his car parked down the street or him standing across the road. I thought maybe I was being paranoid, that my mind was playing tricks on me, but then I'd see him again and again. One night, as I drove home from work, I noticed his car behind mine, following me for several blocks. My pulse quickened, and I tried to lose him by taking random turns through different streets. But no matter where I went, his car stayed behind me. I felt trapped, my hands gripping the steering wheel so tightly they ached. I didn't want to go straight home knowing he might follow me all the way there. So I detoured to a busy parking lot, hoping that if I stopped somewhere crowded, he would leave me alone. I parked and waited, watching as his car slowly circled the lot before disappearing into the night. I stayed there for another hour, too afraid to go home. When I finally returned to my apartment, I bolted the door and double-checked all the locks, my heart still racing. It didn't stop there. A week later, I woke up to find my car vandalized. The tires were slashed, and there was a deep scratch running along the side of the car. I knew it was John, even though there was no way to prove it. The police 
Police filed a report, but without any witnesses, there wasn't much they could do. I felt trapped. I couldn't go anywhere without looking over my shoulder, and every time I saw an unfamiliar car or someone standing on the street, my heart would race with fear. I had no idea what John was capable of, and the not knowing made it so much worse. Then, he started leaving letters. I'd find them slipped under my door or in my mailbox, sometimes in the middle of the night. They were long, handwritten notes, filled with ramblings about how much he loved me, how sorry he was, how he couldn't live without me. In some, he blamed me for everything saying I was being stubborn and selfish, that I was the reason things had fallen apart. Other letters were more desperate, asking if we could just talk, if I could give him one more chance. It was terrifying. I never responded to any of his messages, hoping he would eventually get the hint and leave me alone, but he didn't. One day, while walking to my car, I felt someone watching me. I turned around, and there he was, standing across the street, staring at me. My stomach dropped. I quickly got into my car and drove away, but the sight of him watching me lingered in my mind for the rest of the day. That evening, I decided I couldn't take it anymore. The blocked calls, the emails, the gifts, the stalking, it was too much. I went to the police again, this time with all the letters and emails he had sent me, along with the photos I had taken of him lurking outside my apartment. They took it more seriously this time, filing a restraining order against him. For a while, things seemed to calm down. John stopped contacting me, and I started to feel a little more at ease, like I could finally start to move on with my life. But that peace didn't last long. One evening, I returned home after a long day at work and noticed that something was off. The front door to my apartment was slightly ajar. My heart skipped a beat, and I froze in place, staring at the door, unsure of what to do. Had I forgotten to lock it? Was someone inside? I slowly pushed the door open, my hands shaking. As I stepped inside, my worst fears were confirmed. The apartment was a mess. Drawers pulled open, papers scattered across the floor, and there, in the middle of the chaos, was John. He was sitting on the floor, looking defeated and broken, his eyes red and puffy like he'd been crying. When he saw me, he stood up quickly, his hands outstretched in a pathetic attempt to calm me down. I just wanted to talk, he said, his voice shaky. I didn't know how else to get through to you. I backed away, my heart pounding in my chest. Get out, I said, my voice trembling with anger and fear. I'm calling the police. He didn't move. Please, just listen to me. I love you. I know I messed up, but I can't live without you. We can fix this. We can fix everything. I wasn't listening anymore. I grabbed my phone and dialed 911, my fingers shaking as I pressed the buttons. John's expression shifted from pleading to panicked as he realized what I was doing. Don't do this he said, his voice rising. Please, I'm begging you. Don't do this. But it was too late. The police arrived within minutes, and they arrested John right there in my apartment. As they led him away in handcuffs, I felt a mixture of relief and fear. I was glad he was finally being taken away. But the reality of what had just happened hit me hard. He had broken into my home. He had crossed every boundary imaginable. The legal process that followed was grueling. John was charged with stalking, harassment, and breaking and entering. I had to testify in court, reliving every terrifying moment of the past few months. I shared the letters, the emails, the photographs of him outside my apartment. I explained how he had followed me, how he had slashed my tires, how he had refused to leave me alone, no matter how many times I told him to stop. John's lawyer tried to paint him as a man who was simply heartbroken, who had made poor decisions in the heat of the moment. But I knew better. This wasn't love. This was obsession. He had manipulated, controlled, and terrorized me for months. In the end, the evidence was overwhelming. John was convicted and sentenced to jail time for his crimes. The restraining order was made permanent, and for the first time in what felt like forever, I started to feel safe again. 